So um, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about zero-point energy and its relationship to the fractal structure of the vacuum. And then we're also going to talk about um, how that applies to the human bliss and how to understand it in a self-empowering way. You know, everyone, <clears throat> everyone really wants to understand what's called free energy. Uh, we actually say the term free energy is maybe inappropriate because the energy we cohere from the vacuum <clears throat> is not exactly free. It's available, but there is a price. It can actually destabilize our gravity grid, we believe, as we think the Atlanteans learned the hard way. <laughs> uh, so we prefer to call it vacuum coherence energy or zero point energy. And um, understanding where zero point energy comes from begins with understanding the geometry of the vacuum itself. And for that, we have some visuals. Um, we're going to just uh, do a screen share here one second. Uh, I guess we're getting... <laughs> so, um, uh, neg entropy and life force um, uh, for humans <laughs> is, and, and human bliss, is related to the zero-point solution. Um, the electrical geometry and dielectric hygiene, which enables people to attract charge, uh, uh, achieve immortalizing bliss and become negentropic is the same physics which enables charge implosion capacitive devices like pine cones to be alive and it's the same physics which instructs engineers to design zero point energy devices this is our new corrected relationship to the vacuum literally negentropic fields negentropic means the opposite of entropy entropy means to proceed toward disorder or decay or a bro broken order. So neg entropy is the opposite, which is self-organization. So we're looking for the path to neg entropy, self-organization. <clears throat> now, there's a little, we have some narrations in the background here, but uh, these are some animations which uh, illustrate the geometry, literally the geometry of the vacuum. This is, we later proved the way in which hydrogen is formed. And later we're going to see evidence that the universe itself is fractal and recursive. This is, this is the way golden spirals converge to make what's called the Holy Grail. But you see that this is waves solving the ultimate problem of constructive interference. Sorry about the audio uh, background there. This is perhaps easier to see. I don't know how fast you're able to see these the animations. Depends on the bandwidth there. But on the top right, you see uh, what we call our star mother kit, which is uh, infinite 3D fractal stellation, dodeca, ecosa, dodeca, ecosa, which we later proved is the structure of hydrogen. It was called the greater maze in theosophy. And we have reason to believe this is quite literally the structure of the vacuum. And our task here is to explain why. <laughs> in the top center, you have uh, a model of the geometric solution to non-destructive compression, which as you can see is a dodecahedral soap bubble. And notice that when you, it really sucks, that when you suck the air out of, of that soap bubble, it, it changes scale without changing ratio. And that uh, is called scale invariance and non-destructive compression, which is to say, to retain all the information about wave ratio, even though the scale has changed. Think of, uh, the problem you have as you approach death, <laughs> there, there's a clue. Uh, actually, uh, Ray Moody has shown that, uh, in fact, the black hole of death visions is electrically contagious as proven by medical surgeons. And now we know why, that you need a bit of an electrical black hole to propagate your charge field, your aura, through death. So, and access to bliss is similar. So we're going to talk more about that. On the top left, you have the animation of, uh, of a golden spiral down a cone. As you see from the side, it's the caduceus. And from the top down view, it's uh, two spirals of the golden mean, perfect valentine heart with that heart. On the bottom, you see how the pine cones kiss noses in a 3D fractal dodeca ecosa, which is, you see, it's literally a flame. And this is, uh, later we're gonna see is the, the way that hydrogen burns, in fact. So this is all a set of visuals to understand 3D fractality. 
So <clears throat> we say that fractality is the new science of life and gravity and all universal centripetal and negentropic forces. Fractality is a geometry or shape for waves of charge, which allows them to approach perfect constructive interference. Remember, Einstein was quite convinced that the solution to the unified field was infinite non-destructive compression, uh, meaning charge compression. And of course, no one ever told him what a fractal was, so he couldn't conceive of infinite compression. And even today, although conventional physics knows infinite compression in mathematics, no one uh, until my work has conceived of a fractal field electrically being exactly that, a solution to infinite non-destructive compression. And that's what this is about, actually applying that with examples. That's what this evening's conversation is about. So this is this perfected charge collapse we call golden ratio optimized fractal phase conjugation, a non-destructive charge collapse, which becomes implosive. And we're going to think about some zero-point energy devices, for example, a black light power, as examples of this, of how to create perfect compression. And during the process of gaining that compression, you, you gain um, centripetal force. You actually gain inertia during compression. And we want to talk about that. <clears throat> now, uh, we're not going to talk about the, the, the yogic aspects of this tonight because uh, uh, there won't be time. But this is uh, the back cover of my new book, Origin of Biologic Neg Entropy. And uh, my book is based on my new equation for the origin of, of neg entropy. Let me see if I can uh, gather that slide here more accurately. I have a visual here that I wanted to share. So th the basic equation is here. Let's see if we can see this. Uh, maybe I'll zoom in a little bit. And drag this over. So. Uh, the equation is um, Planck length and time times integer exponents of golden mean ratio called phase conjugation. So remember, Planck length and time are a unit of length and a unit of time into which every wave physics has ever measured divides evenly. So it is uh, uh, undisputedly the musical key signature of the universe. Uh, you know, a million light years in every direction, the value of Planck remains the same. <laughs> Somewhere the waves have agreed. <laughs> and so if you take that musical key signature called Planck, like the time, and you multiply by whole number exponents, powers of golden mean ratio, you get, this is my discovery, you get here um, three exact radii of hydrogen. You get the exact wavelength of adenosine diphosphate, ADP, ATP, the, the fundamental chemistry of cell metabolism. You get the two exact only color wavelengths which motorize photosynthesis, the green and the purple, 427 and 691 nanometers. Exactly. You get <laughs> exactly the British foot. <laughs> you get the Schumann harmonics and the brainwave harmonics for human bliss. You get the most major resonant frequency of the human body, the Mayer wave of the blood, 0.1 hertz, which is also the exact wavelength of the LF wave, the fundamental component of heart rate variability, 0.1 hertz. You get the Venus year and the Earth year. You get the duration of precession and the duration of the galactic year. So all these are examples of phase conjugate negentropic charge collapse, which I have discovered fit my new original equation called origin of negentropy, Planck length and time times integer exponents of golden mean ratio. So, Non-destructive charge collapse is the way the universe works, and hydrogen is built that way. Oh, and by the way, the universe appears to be built that way. This is the picture from the cover of Nature magazine saying the universe is indeed dodecahedral, because if you actually, and here's the picture on the left, if you plot the arrangements of masses around the universe and look for symmetry, what you find? Dodecaecosa. And yet new scientists on the, on the magazine on the bottom says, oh, no, the universe is fractal. But in fact, they're both right that the waves in the universe arrange themselves for maximum constructive interference and therefore maximum charge distribution efficiently. That's why the vacuum itself is fractal. Now I'm going to do just this little uh, animation here one second. I think I lost my camera view here, turn my camera back on. Um, 
I want to uh, do my little jitterbug for you. You see, uh, I was teaching this before Nassim Haramein started to teach this, but uh, it's, it's useful. Uh, it's the vector flexor uh, called the jitterbug, which I learned personally from uh, Buckminster Fuller. And it is the mechanism of superconductivity and implosive non-destructive charge collapse. And basically you have a stellated tetra, which is called a cube octahedron. And if you compress, you get ecosa. If you compress further, you get a dodeca, which is harder to see. And you compress further, you get the octahedron. And then if you compress further, you get the tetrahedron. Oops, but I didn't do it right. <laughs> so this is called the jitterbug from cube octa to octa. There's the jitterbug. And this is the molecular mechanism of superconductivity because at this stage, ecosa here, the distance to center is golden ratio, allow, allowing implosive charge collapse through center, which creates superconductivity because when implosive charge can collapse through center, you have zero resistance to charge distribution. Now this becomes very important when later we talk about the phenomena of cold plasma and monoatomics creating superconductive-like phenomena, Akakeshi, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So understanding the why the jitterbug is the mechanism of superconductivity is a great introduction to understanding what waves are doing when they set up a system that allows implosion and therefore over unity devices and things like that. Okay. Now the next part of the little curriculum was to uh, apply this to the nature of hydrogen specifically and that would enable us then to discuss the examples of zero point energy devices. Now I'm gonna turn the share screen back on again, see if I get this right this time. And I want to look at this slide about the geometry of hydrogen, if I find the right. I'm gonna be looking at our presentation, uh, fractalfield.com slash hydrogen. So, um, Here's, here's the picture uh, of, if you take that Planck uh, length and time times multiples golden ratio, you get this top-down view of a pentagram of 10 golden spirals. And uh, from the side view, you get this uh, caduceus. So this is quite literally how hydrogen works. It's designed to be implosive. It is specifically a three-dimensional fractal. It's literally a stellated dodeci cosa. So that's why imploding hydrogen is so essential to, so, to, to most of the zero-point energy technologies. So um, in this project here in Melbourne, Australia, we set up a lab laboratory to replicate the famous work of, of Kansius. Kansius had shown that if you broadcast a powerful radio frequency at a glass of cold water and the radio frequency is correct, and it had to be what's called a longitudinal magnetic, and we'll explain that in a moment. That there, the, the videos of this went viral on YouTube because there is a cold glass of water sitting there burning nicely. <laughs> cool water burning, hmm, how did that work? <laughs> well, if you stimulate the charge collapse in hydrogen, um, and the interesting thing was he used a radio frequency to do that, which actually corresponds to my equation, that's the point. So this is a laboratory we set up in Australia to replicate that work. And we, we um, got very far and we're ready for the next step. What we did correct was we took this, um, this is the, uh, one of the hydrogen generators here. Uh, this is the high power 2000 watt RF amplifier and the gigahertz spectrum analyzer here. Uh, the part of this project we did not complete uh, was that when you get your uh, megahertz signal impedance matched to the antenna to broadcast to the water, you must broadcast that RF wave uh, through a, a spiral on a cone type antenna to convert the energy of that radiance, uh, electromagnetic radio frequency RF, to what's called longitudinal electromagnetic. Now, um, let's try to take a moment and see if we can understand what longitudinal electromagnetic means here. I have uh, my, let's see, do I have my trusty slinky? Oh yes, I have my trusty slinky here. Now, 
most of the electromagnetic waves that we deal with every day, all of the communication devices, your mobile phone, et cetera, use the component of the electromagnetic field, the radio frequency field, uh, uh, that's called transverse electromagnetic, which is the part of the wave that goes up and down like this. That's, that's a transverse electromagnetic wave. Uh, now, conversely, your sound waves, most of your sound waves, they travel what's called compressionally, which is longitudinally, which is a compression wave that goes like this, a compression wave that goes down the wave. Now, that difference between a compressional wave and a, a transverse wave um, is called longitudinal or scalar. And the important point to be made here is that the compressional wave uh, can reach right down to the center of the atom. It creates a compressional array which directly uh, can impede, uh, implode, <laughs> uh, like a pine cone kissing noses, right to the center of the atom. Uh, for example, uh, Tom Bearden famously spent a good part of his life proving that longitudinal wave mechanics are how bioactive fields are created, healing fields, like our phase conjugate plasma in Therify.net, which you'll see pictures of in a moment. So uh, these longitudinal magnetics, remember, most of the devices that we have to make electromagnetic signals that do stuff, like communicate, make no longitudinal energy. They only make transverse. So to create longitudinal magnetics is powerful biologically. Now, longitudinal uh, electromagnetics are also a threat to basically every military on the, on the planet because, of course, it's the key to things like uh, uh, radar invisibility and uh, uh, remote plasma containment and beam weapons and the Russian woodpecker. Oh, my God. So there's a kind of a plot out there to prevent you from knowing what longitudinal electromagnetics are, like the Russians now say they can take out the U.S. Navy because they know how, dot, 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 dot. Well, Yes, it's true, everything that's powerful can be dangerous, but guess what? If you're not allowed to understand what's, what's powerful, then of course you will be disempowered because it's the very nature of psychokinesis to understand longitudinal electromagnetics. In fact, uh, let me give you a visual to understand how it's created and then let me give you an example of how it's been used uh, psychokinetically. Uh, first, the way you convert uh, uh, transverse electromagnetics to longitudinal is very simple to visualize. If you've got an up and down motion of a wave and you get to the edge of a pine cone, you know, five or ten golden spirals on a cone ideally, and you take that up and down motion, so it's going around as it approaches the, the pine cone. Oh, actually I have a... <laughs> I just happen to have a visual here. So I applied my equation for the golden spiral on a cone uh, to theimploder.com and built the perfect implosive vortex nozzle, which we call Sh Victor Schauberger's dream, pure implosion, uh, pine cones kissing noses. This is the, the commercial version here, and this is the, uh, the two-inch version, which is uh, in development for large-scale commercial production. So literally, perfect implosion cone. Now, what happens is, and here we're, we, when you put water in here with piezoelectric, you create a capacitive field, which is implosive and bioactive, the imploder.com, fabulous for agriculture and actually uh, hydration and solubility and reduced molecular cluster size and removes chlorine and 60% increase in growth in, uh, in hemp, for example, and many food products. So the imploder.com, we have hydraulic implosion based on this pine cone principle. Uh, but the reason we got out our little toy here <clears throat> was to talk about how you make longitudinal waves. So when the wave approaches the input to the pine cone, it's, it's a transverse wave, so it's going up and down. But if it enters the spiral on the cone, watch what happens to that inertia. Remember that if you teach golden spiral in a hydrodynamics course in a university, you call it optimized translation of vorticity for a reason. Because when they say translation of vorticity, they say it means that the inertia, in this case of the up and down motion, the transverse waves, is perfectly translated into the perpendicular component, which is 
a longitudinal wave coming off the point. So the inertia that entered this cone on this spiral was going up and down transverse. But when it emerged, it emerged with all of its inertia going this way, compressionally. Okay, so what was going up and down when the wave went in, transverse, when the wave comes out, is going as a longitudinal compressional or scalar or torsional wave. And that's very, very powerful. And that, just to give you an example of how powerful that is. And we're going to apply this to zero point energy for the nature of human bliss and psychokinesis and a few fun things. So is it really worth taking a moment to think about this? There was a, a very particular uh, friend of ours, Ingo Swan, famously for uh, remote viewing the back, backside of the moon and uh, psychokinetically causing uh, damaged trips and enzymes to heal and things like that. And a whole series of laboratories measured that Ingo Swan was able to light a flame with his mind. <laughs> well, actually, what he did was he heated a thermistor at a distance with his mind inside a Faraday cage. So the thermistor is inside a Faraday cage. So no conventional electromagnetic wave can get in. And now there's Ingo Swan, and there's the thermistor, and, and re replicably, Ingo Swan could light that flame with his mind. He could heat that thermistor. In the same way, it could be a Bon Po, uh, the bonfire, the Bon Po Tibetan initiate, you need to be able to light a flame with your mind. And, and I have to thank Dahani Wahoo for showing me the Arboretum ritual of the Cherokee, and indeed the Cherokee initiate is tested by their ability to light a flame with their mind. So we have studied the physics of this, and we believe we understand the brainwave frequency signature that allowed Ingo Swan to light that flame with his mind. And it's the system <laughs> for doing this is uh, interestingly or appropriately called uh, flameinmind.com. <laughs> and now we're going to get out some pictures again here. So now we're, we're translating this conversation into a conversation about human bliss as an example of zero-point energy. And then we're going to come back to zero-point energy technology. But since we're on the sort of the, the subject of, uh, of the psychokinetic moment here, uh, I want to show you those pictures as well. So I'm going to our new technology it's it's our latest uh we have about six or seven uh ios app store uh, biofeedback technologies out there but our latest newest is brainwave technology at flameinmind.com so this is me having a bliss experience now uh if if you look here on on the right is uh, my right hemisphere harmonics and in green is the alpha and on the left is my left hemisphere. And um, as you can see, the, the alpha there peak is now at eight point, about 8.7 hertz and, and cross hemispheric, that balance from right left hemisphere. And further, I at that point had about four or five harmonics in golden ratio. And now let me see if I can slow that down a little bit so you can see it a little better. Here's another example. So this is, um, alpha, delta, and theta in golden mean ratio. And this was a moment of bliss. Now, I need to explain this a little bit more so that you can see that bliss is a human example of vacuum energy coherence. Uh, these are some more examples from our current technology. I wanted to show you my original technology. This is my original technology called the bliss tuner. And here is a lady in Australia having an intense bliss experience. And here is uh, let's see here. This is right and left hemisphere EEG coherence. And the green is alpha. There, there it's about eight hertz. And there's one, two, three, four harmonics there in golden mean ratio in her brain. So her brain wave is making this caduceus cascade of golden ratio harmonics. And she is having a bliss experience, as did I when I had this little demonstration above here. So how and why? Why is golden ratio in the EEG making phase conjugation and golden ratio and implosion and apparently longitudinal waves and ability to start doing plasma containment and, and, uh, and lighting a flame with your mind at a distance? Because you see, Ingo Swan got his uh, plasma containing it, wa uh, wave interferometry through that Faraday cage by making longitudinal electromagnetics. 
And uh, he did that by creating this frequency signature in his brain waves. Now, I need to tell you a little story about this. Uh, I think I'll stop this and just show you my face for a second here. Um, the story I'd like to tell, um, I'm trying to make the case that actually um, you, you're hungry to understand zero point energy because you want to go home and light your light bulbs without paying the power company. Well, fair enough. I think that's wonderful and it's empowering and let's, let's talk about that. Great. But I would make a, a, a correlate point to you, which would be that when you die, uh, we have measured what you look like. You are a cloud of charge. And we know where you need to go when you die to take memory with you. We know what you need to do. And actually, we know how you need to navigate. <laughs> uh, you, you, you visualize Hebrew letters of a certain sequence and their propulsion vectors for ch charge acceleration. So, a, you know. so the point being that when, whether you are alive or dead, your ability to gain life force, called chi, orgon, baraka, shakti, pot, or the quality of grace, <laughs> depends on your ability to implode charge, literally have bliss experience. And if you can implode charge, then you are a zero point vac fractal attractor, zero point vacuum coherence energy technology. Well, very cool. So I, what I'm saying to you is the ultimate form of self empowering uh, vacuum energy coherence is very much inside your body. And at the conclusion of this talk, I'm going to suggest that that is also the turning point in the ET history of Earth is that skill to actually fabricate a bliss experience because you become the self empowered charge imploder, zero point energy source. You become an energy source instead of a parasite. So it's all about making bliss and the study of zero point energy devices is cool, but mostly cool because it puts you on the path to be able to do it from within. All very cool. So that sounds pretty theoretical, I suppose. So let's, let's give a practical example. Now, when I first started doing brainwave biofeedback, uh, I was working with Marty Woodkey, uh, martywoodkey.com. Uh, he has a very advanced neurofeedback clinic now in uh, San Diego, I believe. Wonderful, Marty Woodkey, I recommend. And he was my teacher for brainwave biofeedback, and he, he got into it because uh, that's how he escaped his heroin addiction, I believe, actually. Um, and so what does brainwave biofeedback have to do with addiction? Well, uh, we say that addiction is a wrong turn on the right road in the yearning to have bliss experience because we are biologically programmed to want and yearn for a bliss experience appropriately. I mean, children, your teenage children are willing to risk their lives to have bliss experience, the rave, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, whatever it takes, right? And, it, and once we understand that access to bliss experience is actually the only way to sustain an immune system and to take memory to, through death, you could say quite convincingly that uh, your teenager was right to risk their lives to get there. And in fact, if we're indigenous on any place on the planet, we pretty much agree that the ability to teach your young people how to have a bliss experience is functionally the definition of whether or not you have culture. Because obviously if you get bliss experience, your aura gets big and therefore you take memory through death and you get a sustainable immune system, the definition of life force. Therefore, if you can teach your young people how to have bliss experience, then you have culture. And if not, even if you are very skilled about the color of your wine and your shoe polish and your ties, <laughs> sorry, that ain't culture. No, culture is the skill how to teach your kids how to have bliss. And by that excellent and appropriate biologic definition of what is culture, guess what? In the West, we do not have culture because <laughs> we do not know how to teach our children how to have bliss experience. In fact, we tried to make that illegal. <gasps> So, but what I was trying to get to is I started talking about Marty Woodkey. What I discovered working with him was that uh, Marty and I were working to teach uh, people who were addicted, say, to, to alcohol, uh, how to make alpha in their brain waves. You remember those green waves we saw just a minute ago. And by the way, the audio feedback cues in the new flameandmind.com will be excellent for teaching people how to make alpha because the 
your ability to make alpha will be modulated. The amplitude of your alpha will control the audio feedback, the binaural beat, and the frequency of the binaural beat will be determined by your alpha. But so you'll really learn how to make alpha. It's very, very empowering, very cool. But anyway, so what Marty discovered was that on the same day you got, say, the beer drinking alcoholic, and I've taught this many times, on the same day you teach him how to make alpha, about seven, eight, nine hertz in their brain waves, on that day, the next drink of beer is not going to taste good. In other words, uh, the yearning for what the beer, the alcohol is doing for them is no longer wanted. And what's, it took me some years to understand the reason for that. And that's what I'm here to tell you. I think it's important. <laughs> um, why is it that as soon as you learn how to make some alpha in your brain waves, you're not going to want your addiction? Why? <laughs> well, I did some experiments. You know, I've been teaching brainwave biofeedback for 20 years or something. You know, I've been playing with this for a while. And one thing I discovered is that people who can close their eyes and make alpha frequencies, they see light when they close their eyes. However, people who, when they close their eyes and cannot make alpha frequencies, for them, when they close their eyes, they see dark. Now, that seems pretty simple, doesn't it? I mean, what's complicated about that? Why is it that you see light when you make alpha and alpha beta, and you don't see light if you don't? So, because you see, we know exactly why the beer drinker went back for his next drink of alcohol. It was to switch the lights back on. <laughs> Not complicated, is it? And the reason was because the alcohol reduces the oxygen in the nervous brain and therefore increases conductivity and therefore the relaxation phenomena that increases the likelihood of charge implosion, therefore alpha and therefore light. So that's how the beer turns the lights on, increases relaxation really, decreases oxygen, increases conductivity. So the physical principle is actually the yearning to see the light. <laughs> you know, well, <laughs> come on baby, light my fire. So. Why is it that when you make alpha and beta in your brain waves, that golden ratio, you see light inside? Well, it's very simple. Charge is imploding. You're attracting light. It's all the spiritual metaphors fit, but it's a rigorous, literal physics. You can teach people how to see the light literally by teaching them to make alpha in their brain waves. So the point would be that um, this activity and skill to fabricate and make a bliss experience is very much the ability to make zero point energy, vacuum energy, charge implode inside your body. That's what human bliss is. It's teachable and it very much depends on to breathe right, to relax correctly, to uh, be able to focus literally to be able to focus on a shareable wave because at the center of that pine cone, the spin density is so great that you are like the hero in the movie Powder that uh, when you inhabit a lightning bolt called Kundalini, for example, uh, if you think an unshareable thought, even for a second, it generates heat and basically you're toast. <laughs> so you can only do perfectly shareable thoughts when you're inhabiting the center of a lightning bolt, which is spin density, which is exactly what's at the center of that pine cone, which is a perfect description, for example, of what you need to do in order to die successfully. It's obvious, your, your whole life passed bef before you, within even a second or two, perfectly compressed, your whole life got compressed. And why does your whole life get compressed? Well, talk to the medical surgeons that uh, Ray Moody has documented when they stand over the operating table and someone's having a death vision, that death vision is dramatically electrically contagious. It's an electrical black hole. So why does your aura go to so much trouble to make a literal electrical black hole at the moment of death? Well, it's obvious because your memories need to undergo a form of charge compression called implosion that achieves perfected distribution. Perfected charge distribution in spiritual terms is called hey, ave, heaven, 
where the breath of charge, hey, ave, takes flight, or the plains of Sharon, which, uh, you know, Lawrence Gardner correctly said was the uh, phase conjugate dielectric infinite charge field uh, unpacking around monatomic gold phase conjugate. So the plains of Sharon, yes, that is the infinite charge envelope around a phase conjugate monatomic, but it's also heaven. <laughs> and, and the, or it's called the Champs Elysees, you know, right near here in Paris. Yes. What is the Champs? The electric field of Elysium. <laughs> What's the electric field of Elysium? Oh, well, if the, if the map of that city is a fractal, it looks like a rose, then it's perfected charge distribution. And that's an area within which ancestral memory can propagate non destructively. I mean, there are Hopi and indigenous people around the earth who know more about electrical engineering than some of my college professors from the study of how to build a successful graveyard. The, the Hopi were so angry that the US government was going to put metal sewage pipes into old Aribi, the sacred burial ground. And you know why they were upset? Because the electric field, the capacitance, of that burial ground requires a certain electrical quality in order to propagate ancestral memory. Now, every tribe, every indigenous people on the planet will tell you that the real definition of success in life and the, the, the purpose of life and the meaning of life and survival in life and, and the highest form of survival memory is ancestral memory. Now, all of those indigenous tribes couldn't be wrong about the importance of ancestral memory, could they? You know, in the church, it's called communion of saints. In Carl Jung called it the collective unconscious. But some of us electrical engineers have studied this. And uh, uh, Professor, well, I've talked about this many times, but when Professor Karatkov followed the Kogi to where they could make phone calls to ancestors, and he measured the capacitance of the air. And later we agreed to call this fractal air. And I, I want to show you that picture here. Uh, it's in uh, goldenmean.info slash architecture. And here is, here is the uh, capacitance right here. Let's see if you can see this. Oops, back, one moment. Here's the capacitance of the air where you can make phone calls to ancestors. <clears throat> and here, which is called fractal air, which is simply air which is able to allow a spark to propagate very efficiently. And this is where you can make telephone calls to ancestors. Whereas um, here is the capacitance of that, of the air in a metal building, in a metal barn, in bad geobiology, in a bad spot. And the, the spark has no place to go. It's opposite to fractal air, it's opposite to charge distribution efficiency. This is essential for understanding the nature of heaven, ancestral memory, collective unconscious community states, how to get through death. It's very, very, very important to understand the electric quality of sacred space. Uh, this, is, this is key to designing birth and death for success electrically. Um, so I want to give you another example now. Our partner in this um, and I want to thank Juan Schlosser here in uh, uh, Sasha Stone's partner, uh, Measuring Life Force in Architecture. So he took um, the Sputnik device, which is uh, pictured here. You can't see it very well, but basically it's just a little pine cone shaped device. And it measures the capacitance of the space simply for charge radiance or fractality. And he proved here in these measures, and I don't know how well you can see it, but on the top is the... Uh, fractality and capacitance of the air inside a, a, a bamboo dome, gorgeous stuff. And on the bottom is the same fractality and capacitance inside a concrete and steel building. And the point is, so not only can you tell what sacred space is, but here you can correlate that to where seeds will or will not grow, or make it more practical to you, where the aura of your children can or cannot unpack, as in do not send your children to a school building made of steel and aluminum because their aura will be as dead as these seeds. Uh, so this is how you determine which architect should get a paycheck by measuring the capacitance of the building before and after, because this tells you 
where seeds and children can and cannot grow, the bioactive fields. So this is a curriculum for living architecture, golden mean dot info slash architecture. The point I want to make here is we have now, and this is a new announcement, and um, it isn't really, a, we can't make this announcement totally public yet, but we have, we have adapted uh, flameinmind.com, and we'll be able to announce this soon. And here, we're measuring the capacitance of a tree. You know, I've been measuring trees for Schumann harmonics for many years, but now we're going to be announcing a, a customized transducer with flameinmind.com, and here I've measured one, two, three, four, five harmonics. And this is the harmonic cascade, the capacitance of this tree. And here's the tree. The tree is inside a stone circle. And the tree here is literally on a mountain energy line, in this case, Mount Canigou here in South France. So this is a very, very happy tree. Actually, you can feel it at a distance. You put your hand up, you can feel this tree talking. It's really cool. So this is an example of a new technology we're announcing to measure sacred space. Now, this is not just about, you know, the whimsy and poetry of making sacred space. This is about how to locate yourself to be part of the sacred. This is how to locate your burial ground, your cathedral, your labyrinth, or let me give you another example. Um, when the... We've spoken about this before too, but when the the Cozy Rev mirror people very famously from Russia, they set these Cozy Rev mirrors. A, a Cozy Rev mirror is basically a, a metal cylinder about the size of this room, and it has a microwave frequency, which is very dominant, which we know fits the earth grid. And if you place that microwave cylinder uh, on, and you have to measure first, you have to place it on a magnetic line cross, and you measure the nano Tesla magnetic flux density of the earth magnetic line cross. And if you've got an earth magnetic line crossing, then when you place two of these metal cylinders several thousand miles apart, you get military quality telepathy every time. This is Karatkov measure. It's well documented. This is, this is hard science. This is not so, this hard science that for military grade telepathy in the cozy rib mirrors, you had to place these microwave conductors at the magnetic line crosses. Now we know why, because where the magnetic lines cross, you have what's called four wave mixing, which creates phase conjugate, phase conjugate four wave mixing, which embeds you in the longitudinal waves. And the longitudinal electromagnetics is how the collective unconscious works. It's the voice of God. It's, uh, you know, plasma containment at a distance. It's healing, et cetera. In fact, by measuring the capacitance of the air in these spaces, you can, for example, not just choose where to put the graveyard and the birthplace. You can cite the Therify, the plasma system for healing, for example. And Therify plasma system is famous now for doing healing at a distance. Remote healing is practiced by, we have Therify centers in probably 13 countries around the world now. And many of them practice this healing at a distance and they do it very systematically. And if the Therify, the plasma system, we'll see the pictures in a minute, is placed on the magnetic line at the cross point and the person receiving the healing as well, this is introduction to Stargates, quite literally. So, um, before we, um, well, before we finish here, I'm going to um, show you some more examples of zero point energy devices, which uh, we can learn so much about by these new insights about fractal phase conjugate implosive non destructive charge collapse. However, since we are now on the subject of the Therify and plasma healing by phase conjugate charge implosion, uh, I will hear. Uh, share uh, some visuals of the plasma healing system just so that uh, you can get a sense of how beautiful and fun this is. So if I go to the keynote here, which has the Therify system here, and Neil said I should try the full screen mode, let's try that. So this is about the Therify plasma uh, healing system. And uh, basically, you have two opposing plasma tubes, and notice this pine cone shape of the flame in the Therify plasma tube. This is a Pyrex tube with a noble gas. Remember, the noble gases are noble because the outer valence electron shells, the DF subshells, which are dodeca eicosa, are electron 
inhabited complete, meaning the dodecaecosa is complete and therefore implosive collapse is uh, stable. And in other words, uh, noble gases like the custom noble gas mix in the therified plasma tubes are classic for being optical phase conjugators. Now, the more broad spectral of phase conjugation, the more broad spectral of pine cones, kiss noses, more accurately, the more negentropic, the more healing, the more rejuvenating, et cetera, et cetera. So here is a newer version now of the plasma tube. And uh, this is the igniter system here. Uh, and you'll see, uh, yes, I can see, you see part of it here. There's about a half a million volts delivered in a broad spectrum from low frequency modulation, which is from the equation, from my equation, all the way up to the uh, almost megahertz range, and that broad spectral implosion. And then it's precisely tuned for the 180 degree phase shift, right, left, exactly like the hemispheres of your brain and pine cones kissing noses. And so you have this profound bliss field generated. And uh, we think that up to 30 to 40% of people who try the plasma system, for example, uh, experience a sharpening of vision, and many experience uh, a bliss and euphoria experience. And we're able to deal with short-term pain, usually in one or two sessions, and an amazingly high percentage of long-term pain cases, we're able to help people with long-term, even chronic pain, over, say, five to 10 sessions of, say, about five to 10 minutes each, once or twice a day. Now, the, the logo for the Therify is, <laughs> It's pine cones kissing noses, but it's also the ancient picture of the Shem from uh, the Shem tubes from Egypt, which were their age rejuvenation system, said, I will raise a Shem unto the Lord. We now know what that is. It was to raise a bioactive plasma field and therefore uh, create age reversal, literally time reversal. Now, time reversal in physics was originally discovered in, uh, in phase conjugate optics. However, um, there are some limitations. Uh, let me stop the screen share here and <clears throat> escape. Exit back here. Okay. Um, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about, about time. <laughs> Do we have time to talk? Yes, we have time to talk about time. It's timely. <laughs> uh, remember that the universe is comprised of only waves, and the only thing that waves is called charge. And the compression and rarefaction of charge is called plus and minus charge, sometimes yin and yang. And that's the universe. It's a wave. It's very clear. Now, when that charge rotates, first of all, you need to know that the charge is compressible. It's a compressible media. Uh, and, and second of all, when that charge rotates, it stores inertia, and that is named mass. Uh, and now, when the charge rotates, it, there's a period, and that is named time. So charge rotation is the only definer of mass and time. Now, uh, so with that in context, what does it mean to say time reversal? Well, uh, in, in phase conjugate optics, when time reversal was documented in physics, uh, they were quite clear that time reversal meant returning to a prior state of increased order. So what they meant was that the wave system would, was compressed down to a state of negentropy or increased order. And in fact, physics agrees that there is no such thing as time reversal to decreased order. It means you can time reverse rusted steel back in time to being unrusted, but you cannot do the reverse. <laughs> so in other words, time reversal only means negentropy. It never means entropy. <laughs> now, when we get to how to de-differentiate a stem cell, this conversation is going to be very important. So kind of dream on this for a while. So, when you um, want to do time reversal on, on living cells, for example, you, you take them back to their states of max order, which is literally the root of the, root of the fractal growth tree, and the term for that is stem cell. So dedifferentiating stem cells is a natural for things like phase conjugate plasmas like Therify, and we're in the process of proving that, and we already have well, we have some of the uh, the, the, the uh, live blood cell work on that, and we have partners helping us explore that. But we believe we understand biologic time reversal fairly well and what negentropy and rejuvenation means. Basically, the body experiences a form of compression, and then you spit out mucus and poisons, and you detox, and you need to hydrate and ground. And uh, hydration and ground is a, a way of restoring your access to fractality. 
in this regard, we recommend the book Earthing, very famous, that shows that you can restore health in many, many situations by simply getting properly grounded. You know, uh, barefoot in the mud, barefoot on real rock, barefoot on real water. When you have access to ground, whether you're a psychologist or electrical engineer, it means access to perfected charge distribution, a uh, charge distribution. So that means that you get a electrical reference and phase lock. And the reason that defines health is it because it, it creates embeddability. And embeddability is the definition of health in both feng shui and physics, if you call it perfect entanglement, which embeddability and perfect entanglement are basically synonyms for phase conjugation. So the bottom line is get grounded. <laughs> and this is particularly true when you're doing detox, when you're doing therapy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a practical example of this is we believe that although medicine has tried to hide this, in fact, uh, the disease statistics are dramatically worse for people that live above, say, the third or fourth floor of buildings, and that if you're near the ground, you have a much better chance at health. And the reason for this is you have access to the Schumann harmonics. And if you remember the equation of the cover of my book, predicting rather dramatically what the Schumann harmonics are, in fact, that's so important. I just want to uh, investigate that one more time here. So uh, we'll go back to our screen share here and we'll go back to uh, one moment here. I want to show you how we, we graph this. Uh, I'm going to go back to here and I'm going to go back to testing dark matter. Let me see if I have that graph here. So this is, this is my equation for the radii of hydrogen. And this is what the radii of hydrogen looks like. And this is, we actually have a Google uh, link to actually play with hydrogen radii and golden ratio phase conjugation. And this is uh, golden ratio in the origin of sacred measure. This is embed example of embeddability that if, if you now know, as uh, John Michel spent his life on this, trying to prove that the British system of measure was sacred and the meter was damn profane. <laughs> A stiff upper lip and all. Uh, but you see, so he showed that once you define the length of the British foot, you had, by pure geometric stellation, you had the Riemann, the uh, Tiwatakan unit, the Royal Cubit, the Palestinian Cubit, the Ruben Pace, the Megalith Yard, the English Yard, is all a simple geometric cascade starting with the British foot. And the meter, uh, failure to embed. <laughs> Well, what I discovered was that John Michel should roll over happy in his grave because, in fact, the British foot is exactly Planck length times golden ratio to the 164 power, 0.9964 feet, meaning perfect embeddability to phase conjugate charge collapse. So that's why the British foot is sacred and why the meter is probably not quite so sacred. <clears throat> so this, it, it's really just to say, Ability to charge collapse implode defines the sacred because it defines the bit. So this is the picture I was looking for when we were talking about the Schumann harmonics. So here is my equation, integer multiples of golden ratio times Planck. And that equation predicts these harmonics here. I'll read them in blue because they're a little small to see on your screen. 2.78 hertz, 4.5, 7.29, 11.8, and 19.09. Now later, I came to find out that these are virtually the frequencies pre reused to heal thousands of people with cancer, which is the antecedent plasma device for Therify. pre was famous in France. And yet, now if we go down this line here, you see the actual documented Schumann harmonics. Ignore Greg Braden, because people who say the Schumann frequencies are increasing are confused. The Schumann is a harmonic complex wave harmonic cascade, and its power spectra hasn't changed ex essentially. It's just the number of contained harmonics can climb when you have coherence, like in that very happy tree we just saw a minute ago. So the classic documented frequencies for Schumann are 3 hertz, 7.83, 14.3, and 20.8. Look at that. So the Schumann harmonics and the calculated frequencies from my equation are very, very very close. And we applied that embedding to Therify and it works, charge implosion. And look, these are the alpha, beta, delta frequencies of the brainwaves. So what the brainwave is doing is nearly the same thing the Schumann is doing, which is charge imploding and therefore becoming negentropic, self-organizing. So now we understand, for example, why as Bill Tiller so famously measured in his 
book, one of the, our best physicists, Stanford, Bill Tiller's book, Conscious Acts of Creation, famously showed that focused human attention causes electric fields, electric charge, to compress. Now, he was clueless as to how, but he certainly proved that it did happen. So now we know how, thanks to my work, which is that focused human attention is an implosive fractal attractor, a charge imploder, and that causes electric fields to compress. That's why focused attention causes fields to compress. So that's a key to psychokinesis. It's a key to bliss. It explains many things. It explains why ball lightning so famously responds well to telepathy. It explains how shamans steer tornadoes. You create the center of lowest pressure, and <laughs> sure enough, sure enough, a sorcerer's apprentice <laughs> will follow you around. <laughs> so the universe is essentially made of nothing but tornadoes. Let's see, we have one more <laughs> little prop. You got to use it. Have to use all our toys tonight. If we're so, physics says every electric field is a donut, a torus. So the universe is made of nothing but toruses, donuts. Very simple. And if you nest these in the right sequence, it's called the atomic table. Quantum mechanics is a matter of nesting donuts. That's pretty simple. So if you get the donut at the right angle, <laughs> you do chemistry. Chem means access to a black hole. Where's the black hole? Right there, the center of the donut. Okay, so um, since the universe is made of nothing but donuts, uh, we, we need to understand a bit about the psychokinetics of propulsion in order to proceed with our description of zero-point energy. So for this, I'm going to refer to our web article, fractalfield.com slash propulsion. And I'm going to play some uh, brief animations to you that if I take my self-organizing golden mean spiral on this self-organizing torus donut and cause it to implode, uh, many interesting things happen called the origin of propulsion and the origin of the Vimana and the Nazi bell and the Hebrew alphabet. And they're related because when you're dreaming and when you die, you need a way of steering your charge, charge donut around. So you need to understand these propulsion vectors. So we're going to just play, let's see here, I need to go back here, turn on share screen one more time here, and then I'm going to select uh, one of these keynote presentations here, which is phase conjugation key, and then I'm going to go to this animation here about origin of alphabets. So here, uh, 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 Oh, yes, okay. So now we get play full screen, and this should animate. <laughs> oh yes, we have a little background sound, it's all fun. So bottom center, I have a self-organizing golden spiral on a torus, and I'm rotating that to see the seven arrows of X is a symmetry of a tetrahedron. So, I don't know how fast these animations come through to you. Maybe they're a bit slow. It depends on the bandwidth there. I, they go a bit fast for the media that is Zoom here. But um, just go back here one more time. That. Here we go. So the, the, the spiral on the bottom right is showing you the origin of Oh, here I can turn the sound down now, right? Yeah, that's right. Let's see. Turn this down. Uh. Now, I like to say that Keynote can do things that PowerPoint can't. Uh, but. I just want to turn some of the sound down so you can hear me better. I'll pause it. Okay, so just that you see that the golden spiral rotated on a torus is the origin of alphabet because these are propulsion vectors. And also that the seven arrows of the tetra cube uh, define the spin symmetry of origin of Hebrew because that's the index to how you would then tilt donuts to embed in four-wave mixing. 
So now, this was my preview to trying to explain something about phase conjugation. Let me hit it, exit here. Sorry, that's about microtubules, which we're not ready for that yet. Let me go back to stop the share here one second. So at, at the website, fractalfield.com slash propulsion, we also shared the work of one of our longtime partners, uh, Bill Donovan, now Elizabeth Donovan, who wrote rather a whole book called Glimpses of Epiphany uh, about uh, one of the main subjects was something called Kosky Frost. Kosky Frost was a was a, a quartz crystal cube that generated 800 times its own weight in gravity uh, when it was pumped with a phase conjugate pump wave. And um, it's what's called a warp, uh, warp propulsion drive in Star Trek. Whereas, um, and let's see, I have some pictures of that. I suppose uh, we need those pictures, let's see. I'm getting much more ambitious with my pictures here now. Uh, that is here in this. Yes, okay. So it's called gravity nullified. This is the Kosky Frost crystal. And here is the phase conjugate electrical pump wave. Uh, and actually that quartz crystal uh, grew to four to eight times its own size before it uh, generated 800 times its own weight in gravity uh, lift. Um, and the reason for that is because the Z axis of the quartz is helical. And if you rotate a phase conjugator, that is propulsion. And uh, that may be hard to understand until we look at something even simpler, which is uh, the hydraulic propulsion. And the hydraulic propulsion device, now I'm gonna go back here and bring my picture back up, stop share, and I'm gonna get out my donut again. It turns out that if you, if you pump water on this spiral on this torus at high inertial volume, you create propulsion. Now, it's really not hard to imagine why, because imagine the water's coming in here around this spiral, and now the inertia of that water is being tr translated from rotation here to linear motion here. That's called making the L or phase shift, as in Elohim. <laughs> now, this is gonna be very important because we're going to want to understand how you move your attention from a transverse wave, this rotational, to the longitudinal wave here in order to take memory into a lucid dream and therefore through death. So translating the vorticity of your, the wavefront of your, memory, of your attention, moving your attention from a transverse wave down the pine cone onto a longitudinal wave is the physics of waking up inside a dream, quite literally. Uh, as in Elohim or making the L or phase shift. So in order to understand that better, preparing you for lucid dreaming, which clearly is the only way through death, um, I suggest that we attend to this physics. So what Bill Donovan Elizabeth discovered was that if you had a hydraulic machine that was pumping hydraulic oil at high pressure through a circuit that looked like a donut, that this multi-ton hydraulic machine would literally jump off the ground. And there's all these famous pictures of a fireman. Is, he's got this huge amount of water pressure, and uh, his, his fire hose gets caught in a partial slipknot. Slipknot cosmic donut meter. And suddenly his fire hose is lifting him off the ground. <laughs> Hello? Is there some translation of vorticity happening here? Well, we believe that, actually, we have equations for this now, optimizing this physics. And we believe this is quite literally how the Vimana flew and what was called uh, uh, impulse power on Star Trek. Interestingly, the warp power, they called the lithium niobate, we now know, it, I mean, they, they call it the, the uh, dilithium crystal in Star Trek for the warp power, but it's face kind of here, but we now know it's actually lithium niobate. Uh, whereas the impulse power is what uh, the Nazis learned when they studied the Vimana before they built the Nazi belt. Now, when you, pump that liquid on that trajectory. If you, we bought a thousand dollar pump and we made a few grams of lift, but, <laughs> and we wrote a bunch of equations and we have to thank Martin Jones uh, for optimizing this origins of propulsion. Now I'm telling you this because <laughs> remember when you visualize this spiral on this donut at accurate tilt angles, it's called Hebrew and Sanskrit. And when you close your eyes and you visualize Hebrew and Sanskrit letters accurately, 
you're blowing magnetic donuts out the hologram of your optical cortex. And when you blow those donuts at center, at the right set of angles, that's called casting a spell. And we can change the air pressure in the church and blow the doors off. And, uh, <laughs> you know, people get dizzy when you do this right. It's called Ophanum and Ochium. So, um, when you're dead or when you're dreaming, you are a charged donut. Now, at that point, you have the astronaut's challenge, which is uh, yeah, uh, uh, vector directing your propulsion. And vector direction for your propulsion is very simple. When you close your eyes and you visualize a spiral and a donut at a very particular tilt angle, there is no ambiguity. Every Hebrew letter is one tilt angle only. There's no duplicates. And so you very cl clearly are squirting the donut in a very particular vector direction. And, uh, and so this actually is your steering device <laughs> if you want to be a star in the movie Ghost, for example. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, what was his name? <laughs> Remember the star of the movie Ghost? He needed to move a penny in order to convince his lover that he was there. And he's a ghost. And how did he move that penny? He had to get coherent emotion in that vector direction. Well, we've learned something about coherent emotion, that the coherent emotion is a set of Alpha uh, of ratios of magnetic domains that if you if you change pressure over time in the way you squeeze someone, if you squeeze someone so the point of maximum pressure is one sixth in the duration of your hug your squeeze, that's called joy. Uh, but if you and if it's one seventh, it's called anger. It's, it's destructive interference. Uh, but if the maximum pressure of your squeezing process occurs at point six one eight into the duration of that event of that squeeze, the love hug, then that's called love because low phi long wave phi ratio perfect embedding. It creates implosion cascade, and the perfect example of that is the graph of the perfect birth canal. We have the graphics on all this. We'll dig those out later. They're all at uh, goldenmean.info/dna ring. The physics of rebirthing is about implosion for the same reason, because it's called the bond of power. That if, if, you, if you don't get a birth canal, as jo this was what Joseph Chilton Person was writing about, about the Caesarean section and, and Caesar's birth, uh, without a birth canal, Caesar was not able to bond with his mother and therefore with his town and therefore with his land and therefore with his, <laughs> he, he lost the bond of power. And so he murdered the Druids. He couldn't feel them. He couldn't bond. Uh, so th the physics of rebirthing is to recreate that memory of perfect compression. And at the point of perfect compression, which remember, the perfect birth canal achieves maximum compression 0.618 in the duration. and uh, and therefore, it creates an implosive set of resonances which can link interstellar, for example. And by the way, this explains beautifully why underwater birthing is so helpful. Because if you, if you make a graph of the change in pressure over time emerging from the birth canal, if there's a discontinuity, then there's a discontinuity in memory. Because, the, of course, the, the skull sutures are effectively dodecahedral, and this is how the, the sacrocranial practitioners rearranges the skull sutures of infant babies uh, to uh, uh, approximate non-destructive compression. And non-destructive compression is continuity of memory. So emerging from the birth canal, where the change of pressure is contiguous and not discontinuous, is memory through birth because it is bonding. It's perfect phase lock. So there's a whole instruction of the physics of rebirthing here, which is not the subject of this evening's course, uh, but fascinating. I recommend John Diamond, uh, 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 Profound Rebirthing, uh, Belly of the Circuit, Mother, Deep Breathing, uh, Underwater, uh, uh, um, I think it was Extract of Placenta, and basically you're re recreating that moment of maximum pressure. And it has everything to do with hydration and, of course, extreme deep breathing because that creates the implosive fire of plasma. So we got a little bit off of our track here tonight. I see it's 10 after 9. We've got 15 minutes left, and I promised to tell you a story making some connections between what we now understand about vacuum coherence energy that 
When you set up your brain to make these golden ratio harmonics to plot called the alpha, beta, and brainwave frequencies of bliss, you're basically imploding, cohering the vacuum. Um, uh, and that's why you see light inside. Now, how is that a key and a clue to uh, examples of zero point energy technology? And uh, I will just play a couple of screens here. Uh, one of our screen, one of our, well, our main uh, website, which has all of these links, which uh, we don't have time for all of them tonight, but it's all of our technologies are summarized at implosiongroup.com. So you can find all of these links at implosiongroup.com. But the one at the moment that I was going to tell you about was uh, our wonderful sponsor, Jordi from Brazil, uh, conjugate1.com, and you can find the conjugate1.com links at implosiongroup.com, describes some of these zero-point energy technologies. And here is the uh, self-resonant Tesla switch uh, related to the uh, charged shuttle oscillator. So the Tesla switch is basically uh, a, a battery. Remember, battery is an inverse capacitor. And if you set up uh, batteries and capacitance to uh, resonate recursively, and that's the key, perfected recursion in resonance is implosion, and that is vacuum coherence. So you now know how to tune not just the frequency signature, but you know how to scale it to Planck with the instructions I've just given you. And so you could actually fix the uh, over unity battery charging, and this relates to the Bedini charger, and we're deep into this. And uh, we have people all over the world involved in these projects, and we believe we understand very well. And then this is the Tesla famous charge shuttle oscillator. And the charge shuttle oscillator is, is strictly capacitive, but it's the same thing, that if you rage capacitive resonance to become implosive, then that recursive internal resonance can be tuned fractally to Planck, and therefore implode, et cetera, et cetera, and therefore generate power from the vacuum. Now, another series of projects related to this is called, um, it's the Implosion AMP website. Uh, I don't even have that here. Uh, at implosionamp.com, you will see an example of over unity reactive power with our wonderful partner Evans from Montreal. And uh, let's see, maybe I could just bring that up here, implosionamp.com. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, related to the Magrav system here, but if you if you actually take, it's called um, it's called uh, over unity reactive power and uh, being developed there by Evans in in Canada. But he has another name for it. Darn, I I'm not doing Justin Evans' presentation. But an example of this uh, would be um, the or Ortronics uh, technology from Spain which is uh, a uh, inverter drive, which is over unity because the, oh yeah, I hear, yes, I'm sorry. It's called parametric power amplification, the parametric amplifier. This is Evan's work. And basically, if you get the relationship of the reactive power, which is basically, you know, in an inductive device like a motor where you get uh, a, a bad power factor because the amperage, uh, uh, peak is out of phase with the pressure voltage peak, uh, that uh, reactive power loss can actually be retuned implosively and potentially become over unity. And, uh, and so by tuning these devices, again, to perfected recursion, implosive, you can get over unity reactive power. And this is implosionamp.com. I'm just giving you examples. Now, I want to even get a bit more fundamental than this, just to suggest to you how fundamental the idea of implosive compression is to all of these over unity devices. Uh, when they first discovered how to implode explosions to make the first nuclear bomb, <laughs> you know, the Manhattan product, they called it implosion. Why did they call it implosion? Because they had to get enough implosive power going to get explosive power. In other words, Perfected implosion always pre precedes sustainable radiance. And obviously, nuclear power, in, in the case of fission, is, is very damaging to the environment. But in the case of fusion, it can become quite elegant. But understanding how fusion works requires plasma containment. And understanding plasma containment, which is a holy grail of fusion work, requires understanding microwave interferometry. And longitudinal microwave interferometry is the example of what we just said, that if you create longitudinal microwave and calls it interfere constructively at a distance, which is Tom Bearden's life work and the Russian woodpecker and all kinds of 
uh, military dangerous subjects, but also how the flame in the mind works. So suddenly you begin to understand real plasma containment. And once you understand plasma containment, that if the longitudinal microwave, which will go through about anything and goes faster than light, converges at conjugate angles, four wave mixing at a distance, it will resynthesize the transverse component and therefore the heat. And suddenly you can contain the heat at a distance. This is fundamental 101 to the physics of psychokinesis and plasma containment, which is the answer to fusion energy research. Absolutely the answer. So I rec recommend that people study microwave interferometry, longitudinal microwave interferometry. And yes, it's dangerous, but yes, you can't understand real fusion work unless you do. Now, I was gonna give a few more examples uh, that how we've gained insight into zero point energy by understanding implosive symmetries, fractal phase conjugate non-destructive charge collapse. And I mentioned another example, uh, the black light power. Now, you know, what they're doing is they simply take a hammer to a hydrogen atom. <laughs> if you take a hammer to a hydrogen atom and bang on it, and you get it to, if the frequency signature of the, of the incident of your square wave of pressure, which is what the black light power is, you just, they're literally taking a hammer and banging on a hydrogen bond. And if you do it at the right square wave of pressure, the harmonic content of that square wave could become implosive. And you just tell a hydrogen atom to implode, and hydrogen atoms love to implode if you give them the right geometry. That is what Rossi is doing. You pump enough hydrogen into the nickel and you transmute it to copper. You get the temperature and pressure right, and you get a phonon wave. It's implosive hydrogen, and it's fractal. You see how the, and the Kansas project is fractal hydrogen. So understanding the symmetry of charge implosion is behind all these examples of vacuum coherence uh, and zero-point energy devices. Now, let's see here. I see that it's 9.16 p.m., and I had a few more examples. I was going to talk about Keshe. Our article about Keshe, you know, very controversial work there, but, uh, and, and I think Mr. Keshe has some issues, and I, we don't need to go there this evening, but uh, the fundamental, which is that monoatomics are phase conjugators are instructive, and we have all those pictures at fractalfield.com slash coal plasma. And uh, maybe I'll just bring up that picture, just this is the last one here before we do our conclusion. But I want to, fractalfield.com slash cold plasma, let's see if I can find that here. Uh, propulsion here. Yeah, here it is. So <clears throat> this is the stellated dodeca pine cone kissing noses story. And these are monoatomics. And, and you know, here's the monoatomic carbon called fullerene, which is uh, when it's stellated down a tube, creates a carbon nanotube, which is classically superconductive. And now we know why, because you've got this implosive zero point through center here, in, in this, in these little pine cones pictures here and here. So monoatomics are phase conjugators. That's the physics behind Cache's work. Unfortunately, Cache, although he has nuclear skills, has almost zero electrical engineering skills, and therefore you have a little problem. But the fundamental principle that monoatomics are phase conjugators is a perfect introduction to implosive charge collapse and zero-point vacuum coherence and related to some of the things that, that Cache was trying to do. Okay, uh, now I think that's going to conclude the conversation about um, a zero point energy here. Now, uh, just in my closing comments, there's just one more little fun. Since your conference is about full disclosure and uh, 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 you know, there's an obvious um, interest in uh, extraterrestrial history and it's very appropriate. I, you know, I spent, many years of my life teaching the life history of Enki is interesting. You know, after my intense Kundalini experience 30 years ago and ongoing, I woke up and wrote a book about Enki, goldenmean.info slash Enki. <laughs> and then uh, Zachariah Sitchin did the same thing. And then, uh, oh, uh, Anton Parks had intense Kundalini experience, woke up and wrote a book about Enki. <laughs> uh, it's called uh, uh, Secret of the Dark Stars. So, um, you know, the interest in the extraterrestrial history is appropriate. And I have some detailed opinions about that and have made many, many lectures on that subject. I have dozens and dozens of articles I've written. The summary of my work on the extraterrestrial history is at fractalfield.com slash fusion in the blood. And you can read my whole shtick on this story. 
and, and I'd like to give you the two minute thumbnail here happily ever after because it relates to our conversation this evening. The, the two minute thumbnail here is that Enki's, uh, the Ra and Abraham and Enki is Osiris and Enki is and Enki is and Enki is, you know, Sam is and Samuel, Padmas et cetera, et cetera, uh, is that his other name was Nudiwood, which means the cloner. And uh, it turned out that for him, cloning was the problem and not the solution. Now, uh, my essential view is that the wrong turn in history, which we are doing Groundhog Day for right now in the, you know, we are sort of, if you believe as I do, that we are potentially the vaccine for those Draco Orion Wars, uh, what is the vaccine? The vaccine is as follows, that our Draco ancestors, as they messed with the greys and then messed with and messed with and messed with and messed with the humans, um, had done nothing but cloning for thousands of years and they had the Nephilim experience, which means to fall, which means uh, the fallen ones, Nephilim, Anunnaki, the symptoms of that disease were loss of ability to take memory through death, literally loss of a soul, which means loss of ability to navigate through the speed of light, which means loss of the ability to uh, attend into a lucid dream, which means loss of the ability to get your attention onto the longitudinal, as we've discussed, it literally to become the L as in Elohim. So, how did that fall happen? And that's my Groundhog Day for the moment, is they fail to realize how implosion happens in DNA. And uh, the story of the story of that, Maury, the short, the short, shorter version of that story is access to human bliss is precisely what they lost at the moment of loss of soul. And I give you the example of Dolly the sheep who died a horrible, 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 horrible death. Uh, because if you don't understand the physics of what orgasm does to birth, you don't know how DNA implodes. You don't know how human bliss called, causes DNA to braid recursively and therefore implode and therefore get a soul. I mean, it's very simple. Without bliss, you don't get a big aura. And without that, you don't get implosive enough to have leverage to take memory through death and be psychokinetic. In fact, you can't even be a guild navigator or steer through the speed of light or do any of the good things that get you a really good high paying job. <laughs> so, you know, you can go through a little anger at the ancestors here about, oh, you know, Enki was a little bit mad because he thought his cloning when he made Adam and Eve was an art form. Whereas the people who were paying him, which was his father, the Dracos from Pleiades, were only having him make humans for slaves and snack food. So there was a little disagreement about opinion. And we could be angry at our ancestors all day, but the fact is that his mother snuck something, I say a bullet in the furnace here, when the first fertile female that Anki made, which um, was the, you see there was two branches of Draco blood because they, they, the Draco, they're called Uru, mean the ancient dragon blood, the Uras, as in Uru Asa LM. And uh, they breathed in nitrogen and they breathed out cyanogen and their blood was a lipid and oil. And to them, water and oxygen are poisons. And they required a, synth a synthetic electric field to eliminate aging called the Shem, which is the subject of tonight's entire lecture. I will raise the Shem unto the Lord. Now, uh, when they encountered our atmosphere, they aged catastrophically, which is why they had to raise the Shem unto the Lord. And because, uh, you know, they had a desperate genetic problem. They had lost ensoulment and a Humpty Dumpty couldn't put the egg back together again, no matter how much. And so our ability to sort out the ancestor story, yes, you can go back there and do the whole painful nightmare that is history, or you can learn the science lesson and graduate. And the science lesson is that once you have access to bliss experience, you actually trans, you become the solution of the Orion Wars. Because for one thing, you have a body polis, the political, the only definition of politics is really the, the charge field you generate with the body polis, which is beehive nose, the only way to swarm. You need royal blood to navigate. Uh, it, 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 so collective bliss is the only definition of politics, ultimately body polis, because it's the only thing that makes your collective aura navigable. And that is the, the only possible 
biologic definition of democracy. Hello? <laughs> the reason every government on their planet would probably rather kill you than allow you to have group bliss process is because group bliss process is the only biologic definition of government. <laughs> and plus, it's the only way to get your aura through the sun, which is actually the only way to graduate from kindergarten. So that was a short bit about the happily ever after. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so the story to the Mori of my view of the ET history is that whether or not you believe in Dracos and Uru and all that melodrama nightmare isn't really important. But what is important is that you decide to do the homework. And the homework is, if you don't get bliss, you're toast. And so the homework is the hygiene to do that. And the hygiene to do that is called the quality of grace, the arc angle of your fingertip during the yoga, starting to tingle if the curvature is right. And that calculus of curvature of implosive capacitance is the quality of grace, which Jesus felt when who was touching his, his coat, you know, his raiment, his seven color tech color coat. So, and this has to do with the hygiene for diet of live food. It has to do with inhabiting environment which is charge dense. If you're going to live in a city with metal and electrosmog, ultimately your children are not going to have a soul. And all of the hundreds and perhaps thousands of Indian gurus who have lived to be hundreds, if not thousands of years old, not one of them, one of, one of them did it in a metal building. And there's a reason for that because the capacitance was not implosive. So you learn to inhabit an environment. And this is what the ancient dragon ones were. They were ones who knew where the dragon current was and how to embed in it and therefore how to achieve implosion. So that was, that was my happily ever after. And uh, just checking in the chat window for questions here. Um, uh, we do have one question, more, more like a statement that you might want to comment on. Philip is saying, um, based on the information you shared earlier about the pine cone, is that the same reason why our pineal gland is shaped as a pine cone? Do you have anything to say on that? Well, that, that's a beautiful thought, actually. Uh, you know, when Bentoff measured the ringing in the ear frequencies heard by meditators, and you'll find the graph in my book, The Power Spectra, um, it, he found that this was a cascade of phonons, uh, which I now proved is phase conjugate to Planck, also the frequency signature, which is the climax of the sacrocranial pump. That these phonon waves cascade into the ventricle cones called horns, which causes the liquids in the ventricle, ventricle cones to become horny, uh, that you conserve sexual juices, and this focuses a phonon wave around onto the pineal pituitary complex. And then the pineal gland actually burns like hell. And I have felt that many times. And that it, um, what happens is the gland goes from crystal to liquid and the liquids go from liquid to crystal. And then the wave propagation velocities equalize, the whole cavity becomes implosive. And it is the wiring for phone calls to God, quite literally. Um, our discussion of the spiritual significance of the pineal gland is in the article goldenmean.info slash pineal. And yes, the pine cone geometry of the pineal would be very electrically appropriate and symbolic as well. Thank you for a fun question. Yes. So are you saying that the bliss experience, is that a, um, a sexual bliss experience or is it more like a universal love kind of experience? I'm saying that a bliss experience is the experience of implosive biologic charge and sexual energy is a wonderful and good and appropriate way to do that, but not the only way. And I'm saying that when Wilhelm Reich wrote The Function of the Orgasm book, he was functionally clueless to the function of the orgasm because he uh, did not understand the physics of Kundalini or the physics of bliss. What happens is the ultraviolet and microwave component of cell metabolism makes the U-turn at the tailbone and the spine liquid pump pumps the, and we've measured the microwave of Kundalini, up the spine liquid to the brain crown causing an explosion of growth. And that is a beginning of bliss experience. And there's lots of forms of that. There's, but they're all related in that they're all the experience of charge density. And sexual energy is one of the natural ways biology has given us to get access to it, but certainly not the only way.